There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Apparently, I'm reading the Booker Long List in 2021. Shaggy Bane won the Booker. You're not probably hearing it from me for the first time. Let me explain for any of you that didn't see me make this silly promise some months ago. I promised that once I realized how much I loved this novel, I vowed publicly that should Shaggy Bane win the Booker this year, because I am not much into book prizes. I think they're rather silly and usually end up disagreeing with the Booker. Not as much as they did the women's prize. But the Booker is sometimes great choice, sometimes terrible choice. But so I said, if Shaggy Bain wins the Booker for in 2020, I will become a Booker Prize groupie in 2021 and commit to reading the shortlist in its entirety before the winner is announced. And maybe more in the fullness of time, read the entire long list. So that's the promise. I did wake up, curious, I didn't set an alarm, but I did wake up in the very early hours, Tokyo time, and heard the announcement seconds after it was public knowledge, and I was absolutely thrilled, except the part of me that is feeling, what the hell have I gotten myself into reading the Booker Long List next year? Anyway, I am not going to break my promise, I'm not going to hire... Rudy Giuliani to demand a recount or try to, uh, you know, change the vote or anything. It was a well-deserved win. This is a not a Marmite book. I don't know that many people hate it. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but it's obviously a lot of our cups of tea. And, you know, I, I was mute. I loved it so much. It's my book of the year. There's nothing that I'm going to read between now and the end of the year that's going to surpass this. This is my book of the year. So I called it, people. I'm an influencer. <laughs> and I didn't do a full review because I had such a deep emotional connection to it that I, I just don't review books that I love that deeply on, on such a profoundly emotional level. I just don't review them very well, so I didn't do a review. But I have one thing to say about it that I've kind of been thinking about today and over the last few days that I don't think I ever articulated. What I loved about this book, one of the things that I loved about this book that I can't say about many books I've read, not even some of my other very most favorite novels, but I read this about five, six months ago. I can't remember exactly when, but several months ago. And I can visualize, I can kind of, not just visual, visually, but viscerally re-enter each and every scene in this novel. And I can remember how I felt as I was reading it, and I can remember all the emotions of all the characters, and, and pretty much exactly what happened. Now that is a rare literary achievement, or just a, a, a rare connect between reader and text that it's just this story lives in me and I don't think I can say any more than that but that's quite something. Shaggy Bane, what a glorious novel. I loved it. Yay! So in terms of my commitment I am c committing to no more than what I've just said. In other words I'm not necessarily going to do reaction videos or um, kind of go off the deep end with it. I will I will, uh, I will probably, I don't know how much of it I'm going to do on BookTube because many of my subscribers, maybe seven of you, have told me over the years that you value my channel as being a place to get away from all that literary prize nonsense. So I'm not going to upset the apple cart next year and become a Booker groupie channel, but I will be reading and I'll be reviewing and talking about it. But don't worry, I'm still going to read obscure, out-of-print novels about women in the 1930s more than I will be the Booker Prize list. <laughs> all right, I didn't do a Friday Reads last week, and I appreciate all your love and complaints, all your greeting, as Shuggy Bane would say, but it, it was kind of liberating, so I am going to renegotiate the contract that I have with you, my all seven faithful viewers, as... 
Oh, he's changed his channel so many times, I don't know what he's calling himself these days, but the lovely Scottish booktuber, he always says, Hello, faithful viewer. Who is that? Anyway, I will always have a video for you on Friday. But when I'm having a week like I did last week, where I hadn't finished much, hadn't started much, I was just didn't think I had a lot to say, I would rather give you a different kind of a video, like a tag video or something. It, it takes almost as much time and energy out of my Friday to make an 8 minute video as it does to make a 25 video. It's a little bit longer of an editing process and obviously recording takes that much, that many minutes longer, but when I feel like I don't have much to say, um, I, I would just as soon skip that Friday and give you a different kind of video. So that will be going forward. My promise to you. Moving on, I have had a really fantastic couple reading weeks. Not that I didn't have some mediocre experiences, but mostly exquisite. And hey, well, I'm at home today. Kenji's at work, so it's really easy for me to keep filming these addendums. One of the things about not doing a Friday Reads every week is it's easy to lose track of stuff, and I didn't even bother to check my DNF list. And yes, in fact, I do have one bail to tell you about. So this is, I'm filming this several hours after I filmed the, the rest of it, and it's the third addendum I've had to film, because I just not haven't got my shit together. I did end up bailing on that novel hieroglyphics by Jill McCorkle that I was doing on audio. I talked a lot about it the first week I started it, that I loved the main character and her first person voice. Her name was Lil, I think, and she was 85 at, in the present of the story and didn't really care for a lot of the other things going on in the novel. I got, I think, halfway through, maybe a bit more, I don't remember, but I did give it at least half, maybe more. And I quit because even her voice and her character started to suffer from the inadequacies of the rest of the novel, which was there was way too much trauma. It was like character development through trauma. And it was just too much. Now, I mean, there are people in life that have too much trauma. But as a literary enterprise, it started to wobble for me because I didn't really feel there was much else to the story. But suffering and kind of Oprah-esque types of suffering that were just one upon the other upon the other. And so once Lil's character started to wobble for me, I was out of there. I think the only one I had finished by Friday of last week was this uh, short story collection by Annie Poole, fine just the way it was. And it wasn't fine just the way it was, I have to say. I gave it two stars. Uh, most of the stories were really subpar. I didn't mind a couple of the early ones. And the one that stood out as being quite stunning, I thought, albeit perhaps politically problematic, was her story about the buffalo jump, so written from the perspective of the indigenous peoples in ancient times, with the uh, buffalo jump. Deep Blood Greasy Bull. I thought that was really quite a stunning work of fiction, and nothing else really came even at all close to that. And there were a couple that were just pretty awful. So... Greg warned me that it wasn't her best. She put out about three short story collections in a row, and Greg said this one was pretty forgettable, and I would co-sign that opinion. And I wasn't completely wowed by this, but I'm so glad I read it, and I gave it four stars, which for me is just a so-so book. <laughs> John Meacham's... Um, Britta and I have talked a lot about whether it's a biography. I would still call it a biography. It's really about the it's life from birth to death, but concentrating especially on his involvement in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. His Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope. This book made me fall in love with John Lewis even more. John Lewis deserves a, a thousand page biography and I will be here for a 1000 page biography about John Lewis and his thought and his spirituality. John Lewis was very religious and he gets a pass from me because boy did he put his religion to good justice-seeking, justice-achieving results. I just love the man. John Meacham wrote this in a very unselfconsciously, using religious metaphors and so on, and I think it was completely appropriate because John Lewis, if you believe in saints, and I would probably only believe in Saint John Lewis, but I would not argue with anybody that wanted to call him a saint. And this book does a pretty good job of showing why. But there wasn't a whole lot in here that he didn't find, I think, from other books, and that I couldn't have found on Wikipedia. 
mainly the point that I want to make about this and all of the nonfiction reading that I have been doing this month for Nonfiction November is I don't assess nonfiction books the way that I assess works of fiction. A subscriber told me the term for the way that I read nonfiction, and sometimes fiction too for that matter, is Google reading. So it often takes me 10 minutes to read one page because I'm checking something on Wikipedia or Google uh, every time there's a reference to somebody that I'd like to know more about or I want to see what they look like or I want to see if there's a YouTube video of them. And I did that so much with this book that I can't really rate it and I don't have an expectation that nonfiction books are going to encompass everything that I want to know about a subject because that's not the way I read anymore. That's not the way I read nonfiction. So there were a couple times where I felt the narrative kind of jumped around and things didn't get explained well enough. And in those few instances, then I do think, oh, Meacham should have tied up, put a bow on that and before he moved on. But mostly I just wanted to know a lot more about everybody because I was just gaga over all of the information, all of the brave, brave men and women. And there were a lot of women uh, give me some credit for talking a lot about the women that were involved in the movement, some of whom I didn't know anything about. He reproduces Fanny Lou Hamer's speech at the Atlantic City Democratic Conference, I think that's where it was, about her and her family's efforts to register as voters in the Jim Crow South. And here, here's a picture of her. And I knew her name, but I didn't know why I knew her name. And most of the speech is here, and you can find it on audio and on video on YouTube. And it is just... It affected me as much as pretty much anything else that was in this book. So the fact that he gave other important people, including women, voices in this, I would compliment him on that. But no, John King is just... I'm in love with him. This is a good place to start or to read along the way, but... It's not that great of a book about a great man, so it was still a four-star read because of the subject matter. The last three I finished yesterday or this morning, and they are all five-star reads, so superlatives, here we come. I finally finished Nan Shepard's 1928 novel from Scotland, The Quarry Wood, and by the end I absolutely loved it. I remember telling you that I was struggling with the Scottish dialect, the dialogue is all rendered in Scottish dialect. There is a bit of a glossary at the back, but it's not sufficient. And uh, I had fun. Once I realized that that was the way it was, and I just accepted that it was going to be a slow read because of the dialogue, aside from the dialogue, it's not written in Scottish dialect. But the dialogue is all rendered that way. And it was a challenging read, but I just loved trying to puzzle it out. And... The heroine, I think it's an autobiographical novel, I did, haven't done much research. In fact, I haven't even yet read the introduction. But I will do that before I do a full review, because I think I will. It's a coming-of-age story about a Scottish woman who grows up in a rinky-dink little town. Rinky-dink, that's what I say, from Canada, Western Canada, but please tell me in the comment section, is it a word that you use or you even know what I'm talking about? It just means a really small town. But I think it's not right to use it to talk about Scotland. But there. anyway, a really small little hamlet or something. And her parents are embarrassingly uneducated country bumpkins. I love the characterization. And she won me over in the hero's journey of the protagonist that ended up being quite a feminist story that I absolutely loved. And this is the first of a... It's so weird. Is it a trilogy or a quartet? Because it says she published just three novels, but when I go on to Amazon, oops, did I say that out loud? Um, I see titles of some of her books that are described as literally part four of three or something. So I don't know what's going on, but I have the next one in the series. I think it's called The Weather House, maybe, is the other one I have. And if that's next in the series, I will be reading that because this was a very touching and some of the writing was so beautiful especially about her kind of communing with nature and the characters that there was a lot of humor in the characters that really touched me so it was fantastic this has been the biggest surprise of my non-fiction november i both started and finished this one since you last heard from me on a friday reads and i think it might end up being the best book of the bunch some Country Houses and Their Owners by James Lees Milne. 
a short little book. It's excerpts from his diary. He worked for the National Trust, and he was a very gay, very maybe snobbish, I wouldn't, certainly opinionated homosexual appraiser of all the country manners throughout England that the National Trust attempted to, some successful, some unsuccessful, to acquire. I'm not sure that's the right word. I don't, th I don't know if they bought them or what they did, but they're still maintained. And short entries from his diary, house by house. And again, I read this was a Google read, so I looked every single house up and it got so that my internet browser just automatically defaulted to the National Trust website for the next property once I started typing it in. And I love this so much. It was really witty, bitchy, informative, fascinating. I'm not interested in architecture very much, but this made me more so. And just the historical and the colorful characters, the lords and ladies, and how bitchy he was in describing them. Like he loved some of them and he hated others. And it's all here, boys and girls, full of gossip. I just adored this. I'm going to do a full review. This was a gift from Leah. And she said that she read one or two a day, but I read it in about 10 days because I have had to realize that I'm not going to get to everything on my nonfiction TBR because I really want to finish up pretty much everything I'm currently reading so that I can have December to read spontaneously. So because this was a short one, I picked it up and I just loved it. And similarly, this just was a deeply touching, beautiful read that I had read at just the exact right time for me and my Life, Blanket Toss Under Midnight Sun, Portraits of Everyday Life in Eight Indigenous Communities by Paul C. Sequasis, a Saskatchewan writer and photo archivist of the Willow Cree tribe, based in Saskatoon. I'm going to do a full review of it, but it just... I can't believe how ignorant I was of the various Indigenous communities around Canada. Didn't know anything about certain communities and... I just made the time and did a lot of Google reading, but the pictures, this man, just for, for an instance, that man is William Moore, who was Cree, that photo's from 1958, and he is creating art by biting birch bark, and that was an art form in his indigenous community, and he was one of the renowned artists who did it and I've, you can google birch bark biting my god just got so much out of it and i've discovered a new favorite artist i will save those details for my review but it's just the best way to learn when for me that it was so emotional it was just beautiful the pictures and the googling and these the people just jumped off the page these real life people and i got an education that was sorely lacking and i'm going to keep going with my education about the people that we stole the land from just fabulous I've got one more book to tell you about that i have started and haven't yet finished and that is a buddy read with heidi of, of my reading life Helen Humphrey's The Ghost Orchard, The Hidden History of the Apple in North America. And I'm a, about 80 pages into it and really, really enjoying it. It's a breezy, easy to read, fascinating. I didn't know anything about apples except that I never eat them. I don't eat fruit. Um, I am a fruit, but I don't eat fruit. And uh, especially not apples. I'm not, a, I'm not a big fan of apples. I don't hate fruit. I'm just not interested in fruit. Um, never have been. Unless it's grapes that are made into something to drink. Um, there's some indigenous history and different narrative techniques. So far, nothing that's triggering me. Lindy warned me that she goes down a fictional path, and there's been a little bit of, of that that hasn't bothered me, but I hope it doesn't get too woo-woo with novelization techniques, because that's one of my pet peeves. But anyway, I'm loving it so far. It's great to be buddy reading a work of nonfiction with Heidi. One other book that I have started, I almost forgot, and in fact, in my last Friday Reads two weeks ago, I forgot to tell you that I would be starting this, and that's a collection of short stories, The Loot and the Stars by Danilo Quiche, and I have started it. It's a buddy read with Lukash of, what is his channel name now? I don't know. It used to be totally pretentious. If I can find his new name, I'll put it in, type it in here. Translated, I believe, from the Serbian by John Cox. And I have been buddy reading a book by Danilo Kish every year. This is the third year in a row. 
that Lukash and I have buddy read a book by him, and I absolutely love his writing. So these are short stories, and I didn't like the first one at all. Lukash didn't love it, but he liked it quite a bit better than I did. I pretty much hated it. But I am just getting a bare start on the second story in the collection, and it is wonderful so far. I'm expecting I'm going to love it. I'm a little bit late getting my comments to Lukash. I hope you'll have had my comments by the time you see this video, Lukash. Because I'm a bit late. I was kind of pushing myself to finish a bunch of stuff up and put this on the back burner. I'm hoping I'm going to love it because I've absolutely loved the two novels of his that I've read. I didn't review the first one, but I'll put a link in the show notes to my review from last year of Psalm 44, which was a really harrowing, beautiful novel. And the other one of his that I've read and absolutely loved, and it's actually kind of linked short stories, A Tomb for Boris Davidovich. And I picked it up secondhand here in Tokyo, and somehow, I don't know how I got, well, I think I knew that Lukash was interested in literature from this part of Europe and suggested a buddy read. I think that's how it went. Is that right, Lukash? It was three years ago, or two, two years ago now. And we just loved it. It's a collection of linked short stories, and that got us onto a Danilo Kish buddy reading relationship. Ah! So, things have been going rather well in my reading life, for the most part. Uh, and I am going to take on two more books from my nonfiction TBR, and I've chosen them because of size. I'm not going to get to the police book, and I'm not going to get to the Denton Welch book, because I don't want to rush either of those. These ones I won't have to rush. This graphic history, or graphic nonfiction book, about the Dene people up in northern Canada and their fight to protect their way of life from exploitation by the evil white Canadian corporations that wanted to extract natural resources. I got a taste of what that was from the Blanket Toss book and now this is a full exploration in graphic form. It's 260 pages and it may end up, if I end up Google reading it, but I think it will be I'll be able, easily be able to fit this in by the end of the month. And this book, uh, Richard Kapuscinski's The Emperor, I don't think I ever mentioned the translators, which was stupid of me. Translated when I talked about it before, I don't think I ever did. Uh, translated from the Polish by William R. Brand and Katarznia... Yeah, I know I never tried to f pronounce these names. Katarzyna Mrozkowska Brand. Now that I've actually read the back, it's told in the first-person voices of actual courtiers of Emperor Haile Selassie's. So that should be very interesting. And it is 160 pages. All right. So uh, I hope that you will read Shaggy Bane now. Don't listen to the naysayers. Oh, I heard part of, and also I'm going to put a link, not, uh, it's kind of silly for me to put a link to an Eric Carl Anderson video because, good lord, you all watch him, but his reaction video where he, he records himself watching the post announcement interview with Douglas Stewart and the facial expressions Eric makes while he's watching this on his laptop or whatever. Just, it's adorable. It's it's one of my favorite things I've ever seen on BookTube, which is watching his facial reactions. Do watch that. I'll put a link in the show notes. So read Shaggy Bane. Read some of these books. Read something fabulous. You deserve it. Thanks for watching. Oh.